This feels nice. Hi, welcome to Sixth and I. I'm Esther Four, and it's really a pleasure to be back here on this stage tonight. After a decade as Sixth and I's executive director, I'm thrilled to continue to be involved with this amazing institution as a member of the board. And that's why I'm here, not the only reason I'm here tonight. <laughs> And I want to take a minute um, to introduce you to my successor, Heather Moran. Where are you, Heather? The awesome Heather Moran. Yeah. So if you have any complaints, that's where they go now. And I, I, I want to thank Heather and the fabulous staff for inviting me to do this introduction tonight. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing a conversation about an important new book, World Without Mind, The Existential Threat of Big Tech, by none other than our oldest son, Frank Four. Yeah. I also want to thank The Atlantic for partnering with Sixth and I on tonight's program. And I know there are a lot of people from here from The Atlantic. Jeffrey, are you here? Okay, the editor of The Atlantic. There are a bunch of people here from The Atlantic, and we're grateful that you are co-sponsors of tonight's program. The Atlantic is a long-standing partner of Sixth and I, and help us bring journalism to, to life through conversations on this stage. Tonight's event, by the way, is also being live-streamed on Atlantic Live Facebook page. So if you know someone who didn't make it, would have wanted to be here, you can tell them to tune in online. I want to tell you about one more Atlantic event. On September 26th, Atlantic's Radio Atlantic podcast will be here for a live taping and conversation with one of the biggest foreign policy challenges of our time, Russia. Yeah, I, I feel really at home here tonight. Tonight, I feel like I have come full circle. A bit over 10 years ago, when I became Sixth and I's executive director, Frank was one of the first people I introduced on this stage when he was in conversation with Tom Friedman. One of the first things we did to build this institution was to form important partnerships. And it won't surprise you to know that one of our first partners was the New Republic, of which Frank was then editor. The other thing that resonates so strongly for me tonight is how the world has changed in this last decade. It was 10 years ago, for those of you who are watching, t watching TV and following this, I guess not TV, watching your computers, it was 10 years ago, actually this week, that Apple launched the first iPhone. It was also in 2007, 10 years ago, that Facebook and Twitter went global and when IBM created its artificial intelligence system, Watson. The tech world took the world, the tech boom took the world by storm, generating lots of unexpected consequences. And that's going to be the focus of our conversation here tonight about Frank's book, World Without Mind. So Frank, in addition to being our son, <clears throat> was twice the editor of The New Republic, the author of How Soccer Explains the World, an unlikely theory of globalization, named one of the top sports books of the decade. He's currently a national correspondent at the Atlantic and a fellow at Do America Foundation. And another little tidbit, it was just announced this week that one of his recent New York Times magazine pieces is being turned into a film starring Annette Bening. Tonight, Frank will be in conversation with Hannah Rosen. Hannah is also one of the most frequent guests on this stage in her capacity as an author, a journalist, a podcast host. Hannah's the author of an amazing book, The End of Men and the Rise of Women. And she's the co-host of NPR's show Invisibilia about the invisible forces that shape human behavior. Join me in welcoming Frank and Hannah. Hi, Frank. Hey, Hannah. <laughs> um, so before we 
we get going, uh, I just want to thank you, oops, for making it impossible for me to ever order anything from Amazon without feeling incredibly guilty and like <laughs> I'm supporting an evil monopoly. Um, <laughs> Or like liking my mom's Facebook. No, you, uh, shouldn't, feel, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. <laughs> I shouldn't that. feel guilty about it. No. Okay. Uh, we'll get to the practical Nor, nor should things. you especially feel guilty about buying my book on Amazon <laughs> if that's what you happen to do. Um, so, uh, so one thing I want to get out of the way is, uh, you've talked about this, that people perceive the book as dark, uh, which I didn't perceive it that way at all. I mean, the way I perceive this book is it's like, it's kind of like a slap in the face or like cold water. It's the sense that we've been kind of breathing this air without thinking right. about it. And then, um, and then you're just making us aware that the air like has an ideology and might have some poison in it. Right. And, and so it's like critical that we yeah. know that, right? Yeah. Well, there is, I mean, there is a dark sci-fi apocalyptic conclusion one could draw from my book. And so, if, so my book is really, it's about... It's about technology. And technology has been with us forever. It's one of the things that defines us as human beings. But I'm writing about these inventions that my mother just described, which all happened in the short span of time and which are all these totally magical creations. Um, but what's chilling about these creations is that they're not, they're not hammers, they're not, um, they're not microphones, they're not things that amplify humans. These are things that are really merging with us and they're intellectual technologies that help filter the world for us and, and, and shape our reality and then they maybe even be, will become our virtual realities. And so the CEOs of these companies talk about wanting to, to merge man and machine. Or okay, we'll stop there. Okay. Let's start with the merging, because that's, that's, the, that's the first interesting idea the book starts with. Like, yeah. What is the great dream of like, surpassing human intelligence and merging with machine? Can you just explain where that right. dream comes from? Right. Well, so there, there are lots of different versions of this dream, but I'll give you the most extreme version, which also happens to be an incredibly popular version in Silicon Valley, which is the dream of this guy called Ray Kurzweil, who's an incredible engineer um, who's now the director of engineering at Google. And he has this vision, which he's called the singularity, which is that we're going to reach this point where machines are going to be able to create more machines. And computer intelligence is going to be able to surpass human intelligence. And once we get to that point, and he's got a year picked out where that happens. It's like the, what was the year, by the I way? I think it's 2045. And it's the year that it's kind of the foot gets stepped on the accelerator of technology. And if you thought the last 10 years were full of change, well, after that, we're going to enter this, this spectacular space where we're going to get uploaded. In our, uploaded our brains are actually going to get uploaded into computers. And we're going to be able to live forever. And life will be more blissful than you could even imagine. It's so funny because when you just, the way they dream it, it is beautiful. But the way it is depicted in novels, yes. it's a disaster. You know, it's yeah. like they and the not. So, 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 where did you did you think there was something beautiful about it? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> I mean, I really find I find the idea of living forever to be a chilling one, um, and with all sorts of chilling implications for human morality and for for human life. Like what. What will make life meaningful if, if we can live forever and ever? What will force us to be human beings if we're not thinking about the end of days? And so I find that chilling. And I also find the prospect, and this gets to the core argument in my book, which is I find the prospect of merging with machine in this sort of way to be chilling because we're never just merging with the machine. You're merging with the machine that's part of a system, right? And, and in this instance, if we talk, think about our merger with Facebook or Google, which, is, which has happened, or Apple, really. I mean, that's, the, I think, the best example of it because we're now wearing Apple on our wrists and we're now wearing Google on the bridge of our noses and we're a step away from it being implanted within us. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg talks about, he's obsessed with te telepathy. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is this human-machine interface. This is the next thing that Silicon Valley is investing a lot of money in. And so what I find chilling is the idea that I'm merging with the machine that's operated, that's helping me filter reality, and that reality is being shaped in ways that 
I can't even perceive. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> Is that dark? I don't no, know. Is that it dark? sounds awesome. <laughs> um, it, you know, like I said, I read some of the. I just read an apocalyptic novel like that, and it was horrible. So yes, it is dark. But but you know, that's like futuristic. I actually want to talk about what happened. Yeah. So that's what could happen, and what yeah. they dream, and so that's the sort of philosophical foundation. That's the world that they invent. That's their utopia. So you right. learn a lot by knowing what people's utopia is. Yeah. But but there's actually. I mean. A lot of the book deals with what is and not yes. just like what the dream might be one day. So, so let's talk about that. So monopolies, that's the first thing that I think you all need to start thinking about and why the book is critical. Um, what, the word monopoly used to be a dirty word. Like, right. in the course of history, monopoly was bad. We right. would regulate monopolies. We would break up monopolies. So what's, what, what has shifted in the culture around the meaning of that word monopoly? Well, it's not, it's not really the culture. I mean, it's, the word monopoly has kind of disappeared from the culture except for as a board game, right? And so it had this incredible vogue in American politics starting with the Gilded Age when you had the populace kind of rise up against the railroads. And then it became this bipartisan obsession. Um, this, was, this just happened, I, was, I, I ran into a friend who's a conservative today, and he was, at, he was sitting in the coffee shop, and as conservatives do, he was reading the mission statement for National Review, which is the founding magazine of American conservatism. And he called me over, and he pointed to me, and he said, William F. Buckley, in the founding manifesto for National Review, was railing against the dangers of monopoly. And so this was a thing that we all cared about really deeply up until the last 25, 30, maybe even longer years, beginning with a, an article that, um, that Robert Bork wrote in a law review that transformed American jurisprudence, starting with the Reagan administration. Antitrust kind of fell out of favor largely as a vehicle for, for, for shaping policy. Um, and so, when we talk about monopoly right now, um, we have a very narrow definition of it where we, we're concerned with consumer prices. And so, if you look at these monopolies, you look at Amazon. Amazon is awesome when it comes to price. It has the lowest prices, and it will and it, and it'll always have the lowest prices. And in fact, its algorithms help it in, in keeping prices low. But yet, when we look at Amazon and its size and its scope, there's something problematic about it, or it gives us anxieties. And the question is, can we let these companies grow and grow and grow? Uh, but haven't we already done that? Yes. Like part of the point of the book is that we kind of let these monopolies yes. take over our lives, and we didn't notice somehow, or yeah, we didn't right. think about them somehow. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's right. I mean, in, in, I mean, especially, you, t you look at something like the book business. So all art authors are fairly narcissistic. And my awareness of the, the issue of monopoly came when it started to hit home, which was when Amazon got in a fight with my book publisher, my old book publisher, Hachette, over the contracts for its eBooks. Can you and, talk about your experience of writing about Amazon and how they dealt with you? Yeah. yeah. Well, so Amazon, uh, just to kind of refresh everybody's memory, because it was kind of a esoteric debate, but Amazon wanted to set the price that they sell ebooks for. And that's what they did. The first ebook debuted, and Jeff Be Bezos made it $9.99. And he did it without checking with the book publishers. He kind of surprised them. And in the course of doing that, he basically deflated the whole book market, which is not a terrible thing for consumers, but it's not great for the book publishers, and it's not great, ultimately, for the people who write books. And so Amazon was... And why do we mind if Amazon controls the market for books versus book publishers? I mean, just because they used to control the market for books, why do we care that they don't anymore? So in, in my view, we want a marketplace where there are as many players as possible, and you don't want there to be one dominant firm. Because what happens with dominance, ultimately, is that you're able to pick winners and losers. Because Amazon, nobody's a neutral store. Right? Um, there's some things that always sell better than others. And with Amazon, a lot of this is invisible, the ways in which certain products get, certain products, their books, certain books get pushed over others. And you know, just because books are so important and we want there to be a huge amount of diversity in what, what we read and what, what the public has access to and what the winners are, 
in that market, you don't want one firm having that sort of role. It's, it, it kind of sucks that you have publishing as an oligopolical industry. There are five publishing houses. That's not an ideal situation. But what's even less ideal than that is having one primary bookstore have control over the entire market where they're able to set terms for the way that the market operates. And Got yeah. it. Okay, if that's the problem, then let's talk about Facebook for a minute because Facebook is a confusing example. Like, on the one hand... I feel, so, so, so Facebook set an algorithm. The algorithm was supposed to be neutral. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to favor one thing or another, right? But in, didn't Facebook sort of lose control? Like, didn't what happen with Facebook is that under its nose, this, this kind of attempts to control their universe yeah. led to chaos? Like, led to chaos that you they... You mean Donald Trump. Let's, yeah, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg didn't want Donald Trump to win the election. He Probably wanted, not, no. He, no, he Most said he didn't not. want yeah. Donald Trump to win the election. So, so, so what, uh, let's just talk about... And what, he didn't want, like, fake Russian, no. you know, fake Idaho Falls sites run by Russians. Right, well, and you saw the news that broke this afternoon where ProPublica has a story about how Facebook was selling... It. The Facebook algorithm is neutral. And so if you want to go onto their site and purchase anti-Semitic ads, you type in Jew hater, and you have the ability to do that. And there's no policing of the market. Why'd you pick that example? Well... I'm just um, curious. No, what's wrong with pointing to that example? <laughs> no, <nothing>. and, <laughs> um, so, all right, let's just, talk about, let's just talk about Facebook in general for a minute, because Facebook, on the surface, looks like it's your friend's sharing things, and that's what gets put in your news feed. But if you just had all the stuff that your friends were sharing, it would just be this mess of information because your friends share a hell of a lot. And so Facebook created a set of rules for sorting that information, for making some things rise to the top of your news feed. And those, th those rules are algorithms. There's procedures that they have for sorting things out. And so Amazon sets a series of rules. And so it decides that uh, when you take a picture of your family, what, uh, that, that people will, li will like that, and so they'll make that higher. Because what the whole Facebook system is about, needless is to say, is about getting you to stay on their site for Longer. as long as possible because that's how they make money. And so there's this feedback loop that they're trying to create where they're trying to give you what you want. And so if you're, if you're a Jew hater, for instance, they're going to give you a whole Any lot Jew of... Any Jew haters <laughs> here? Just, no. Yeah, okay. raise your hands. <laughs> so if you're a Jew hater, they're going to give you what you want. Yeah, and, well, and that's what happened in this last election. And so, but doesn't that, like, doesn't that, in fact, create more universes? You know, doesn't you, that create you, you less think. of a monopoly? Like, it could be like if you're a Jew hater, but it could be if you're like transgender and you live in Idaho Falls. Like, it could be a lot of different things. It's not right. necessarily... Or if you could be if you wanted to, you know, say, start the Arab Spring and communicate with other people who wanted to start the Arab Spring. Like, it's not just the Jew haters. It's just this giant chaos of... Well, so the problem... I mean, there are a couple problems with... I mean, the, the problems are that when it comes to politics, we get lumped not in a million different constellations were lumped into primarily two constellations that our politics are incredibly polarized. So you have, you have two kind of warring tribes and those two tribes get what they want. And so that you, they get information that confirms their biases and that drives them further and further into their corners and in the end makes them even more susceptible to fake things. Because if you're just seeing things that you want to hear, um, that's the problem. Then the other problem is that in Facebook, everything is about the headline. So if you're in journalism, you know that there's a total art to writing headlines for Facebook. And so you're clicking on headlines. You're looking at headlines. You're not looking at the sources of information so much. And so it all becomes this giant stew. And in that giant stew, it's hard, it's hard to know what to trust and what not to trust and what has authority and what doesn't have authority. And over time, the effect of Facebook, and, and Google for that matter, has been to erode the distinctions between media companies, which erodes the authority of media and, and ultimately erodes truth. Okay. That's the heart of your book, and that's a lot of different steps. So let's 
talk about them. Because, break it down. Break it down. Because I, 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 I'm with you on some, and I need you to convince me on others. So, the, so, 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 that, so we care about the threat to journalism, not just because we're journalists. We care because there's a certain... Like, we believe in a world in which some institutions have more authority than other institutions, Well, right? I, w no, we believe... Well, you can believe in what you want to believe in, but I believe in th that in order for citizens to make good decisions in a democracy, they need good information. You can't make a good choice about who you're voting for, for president, let alone all the other decisions that, that we're, we have to make in, in a society if we don't have quality information. Okay, so quality information can only come from a world of gatekeepers, like a place where there are certain people who get to decide kind of what counts as good information, what doesn't count as good information. Right, so in order for us to have in, or, in order for us to have facts that we can trust, they need to be produced in a certain sort of way, operating by a certain set of rules um, that, that mean that we can, we can that, that, that that expertise of the reporter or the opinion maker who's telling us what to think, we need to, we need to be able to believe in them. So give me an example of like where this has gone wrong in this world. So, I mean, just look at this last election and all the crazy things people believed about Hillary Clinton. I mean, if you go and you look at the polling um, and the voters, specifically the voters who switched from Obama to Donald Trump, they believed the worst things that could be said about Hillary Clinton. And that information wasn't things that they were plucking out of thin air. It was stuff that the Facebook algorithm singled out for them. And, and some of it came through advertising, uh, but a lot of it came just from news. So essentially the idea is like it creates this echo chamber. It's weird because what it created was a world that was like more human than human. So the algorithms... What do you mean? It crea the algorithms created a world of like tribes, basically. The algorithms brought back an era of like extreme tribalism. Like where yeah, you just yeah, kind mean, of connected to your tribe and everybody had their tribe and your tribes all got echoed and people sort of filtered into different tribes. I mean, I think the tribalism existed. I think what what happened with Facebook is that it, it's just this erosion of the common basis for fact. And, and Which it, is what? Like human intuition, wisdom? Like we, we just came to... Conf is world without mind? Is the idea without mind means essentially without common sense or intuition? Like we just mistake data for right. truth? Is that, is that what we lose? So here's, here's what I mean when I mean world without mind. I mean, I, mean, I mean a couple things. One is a world without privacy. And, and I think that this is actually something that we don't totally understand. Everybody intellectually kind of has some dim sense that privacy is a good thing. But why do we truly care about privacy at, at the end of the day? Um, and it is not just because we want to do things outside the public eye. For a democracy, there needs to be privacy because people need to be able to make independent decisions. They need to be able to think for themselves. And if you're always being watched, um, you, then you, there's, you, you, you're, always in, in your, you're always conscious that your, your opinion can be held against you at any moment in time. And so what you need is a space outside of, of, of watchful eyes where you can, you can actually think for yourself and arrive at your own decision without worrying about your audience. So, um, so that's one thing. Although people don't seem to want that. Like, essentially, it's not that people are ducking. It's not, we're not in a 1984 situation. Not, we're not in a yet. kind of no. manipulated situation. Like we're, people we're, are being manipulated to, you know, to basically... Um, like uh, echo their confirmation bias. So people are being manipulated to believe things that aren't true, necessarily. The erosion of privacy is happening on so many different fronts right now between Equifax, between, um, you know, thing, you know uh, kids posting things about other kids on social media and leaving a track record uh, through uh, the possibility that our, our, our reading habits on Google will someday become public. I mean, it, it's happening on so many different fronts, and I think that it's, it's hard for us to comprehend really the ultimate danger of it. And when we think about privacy, we just, we, we all say that we want it, but we don't really know why we want it, and we all fear the erosion of it in some sort of abstract sense, but because we haven't really been slapped across the face with the consequences of losing privacy, we don't really know what we're talking about is what... Right. 
I mean, you slapped yourself across the face in this book. Like, you must, you know, you've slapped many times because you know all of yeah. it, right? And you spent a long time thinking about it. Have you given up anything? If I give it... Uh, uh, like, you has this led you to say, like, I'm not going to... Like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to... It's, it's difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's... If you... So the book is not apocalyptic, but the book lays out a vision which is a little disturbing about the way we live now. Like, right. it does make you aware that the way you live now is, is a problem. Yeah. It's, so I wonder if you, like, I, personally... You know what? It's, it's, I've tried... <laughs> I've tried on the margins, but I haven't really tried to escape myself. And so maybe that's kind of a horrifying testament to the predicament that we're in, that you can be entirely conscious of all the pitfalls and still go along with things. I mean, I think there are a couple examples I give in the book, and, and I think that over time I've tried to... Um, I've tried to, to find moments where I can put my phone in, in, a, different, in a different room. Um, th th that's it? No, no. <laughs> that's, your, that's the best you got? No, I've got, I've, got, I've got other things. I've got a whole arsenal of things. Uh, no, but it's, that's not... It's actually not trivial, I don't think. I mean, I think to find moments where you can kind of truly disconnect mm -hmm. from technology, I mean, that's kind of... That's kind of... To me, it's like the ball game because we're never going to be able to escape technology. These these companies and these technologies all together together on our own. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, a lot of the problem is a problem for society to to find some sort of solution for in terms of applying regulatory solutions that protect privacy or uh, find a better way to apply antitrust to just make these companies a little bit less overwhelming in our lives and to uh, create some true competition. But when it comes to what we can do as human beings, I think that the best that we can hope for, nobody wants to drop out of these things because the technologies themselves are pretty great. I mean, who wants to, who wants to drop out of Google as a search engine or as, a, as, a, as an email? So it's all incredibly convenient. And I would be... I would be uh, I'd be a big hypocrite if I was saying that that's what people should do because I use those services myself. But I do think that, I, you know, as I think about my day and I think about... I'm asking you sincerely because yeah. I read the book and I thought, okay, I, I understand what's, what's happening. I'm just not sure, like, what to do. Like, I understand what should be done on a public policy level about monopolies, but what culturally is like, whenever I find myself in a position of saying you know, bring back the gatekeepers. Yeah. It just makes you feel like... Um, well, but, but we're talking about the personal here. Yeah. And, and so the, with the personal, there are a couple things. One is that over time I found myself, I, I found myself kind of first subconsciously retreating to the paper book. And so I feel like I, I, when the Kindle came, came about, I was, I, I, was, I was with it in an obsessive sort of way. It seemed so amazing to me. But then there was this moment where I found myself drifting away from that back to paper. And I started to ask myself, what was it about paper that was beckoning me? And it was, it was this whole notion of disconnecting. It's not like the Kindle is such a terrible device. It's actually, it's kind of placid to read on the Kindle. But we're on screens all day long, all the time. Every time you're on a screen, I mean, maybe not the Kindle itself, but let's say, you know, you're on an iPad or iPhone, you're distracted, you're connected to a company store, you're being tracked, and so you've got to look for the seams in the system and the places where you can, you can, you can, you can disengage. So that, that's, that's one thing. But really, the idea, of, so, so you mocked the idea I was going to say in the Gary Steingart book, which is like a little bit apocalyptic. I mean, it's the yeah. universe you describe a little bit down the road, maybe 2074. Like the secret thing that he does is smell books. He like right. <laughs> goes into his little room and but sniffs the books. That's, they, like a, that's like a rebellious act in the book. They yeah. smell so good. They smell so good, yeah. But do they really? I don't know. I'm just, you know. Um, you should have people when they sign. Yeah. Smell it. My book smells good. Yeah. My, my, my book smells like perfume. You'll never want to take it off. Um, uh, so, so that's one thing. It's so the idea of finding opportunities for disconnection. The second is that I actually think that we need to be, in the end, and this is going to sound funny, but a little bit more snobbish 
about, about culture and about what we consume and how we think about um, how we interact with ideas and culture. And so um, the analogy that I, I have in, in kind of an extended fashion in the book is to food. And so... I love this analogy. It was really helpful. To, so, if, yeah, go ahead. So, so with it's food... really helpful, yeah. With food, one of the, So 50 years ago, TV dinners, processed food came, and they seemed so good. There were no pots and pans, and you didn't have to go to the store all the time, and it tasted... It tasted it tasted pretty great. Or, it, but then, and it was efficient. It was efficient, exactly. Yeah. And then 50 years later, we woke up and we said, holy cow, this stuff was filled with sugar and salt. It was, it, it was engineered to addict us and to make us fat. And it disrupted the whole food chain and it concentrated power in the hands of a few, of a few corporations. And we have this massive social crisis because of it with, with, with childhood obesity. And... I kind of feel like the same thing is happening now with the stuff that we ingest through, through our minds, um, that it's being re- reverse engineered to addict us, and it's remade the whole economy of cultural production. And so... Because we're addicted to efficiency, to getting things quickly, yeah. um, right, and to having things exactly when we want them, and so we're losing some other plane of ourselves. Here's the problem with that metaphor. I, w- I think it's, it was a great way to set up the book because it really helped me understand the sort of world I was living in. Um, uh, you know, we need to be more snobbish. Like, we've created a, a very bifurcated class system of food, you know, where it's like there's expensive elite food and then there's everybody else's food. And so, and so the gatekeeper argument just, like, like it, it smells a little bit like that to me, that, like, why, you know... On the one hand, you know, people got more accurate information, but on the other hand, the sort of chaos has allowed just like millions of voices and people who otherwise wouldn't have had a voice, you know, the whole era of blogs when people could just write what they wanted. Like, there's also something beautiful in that. Yeah. There's something horrible in that chaos, but also beautiful in it. I, I have some respect for the chaos, but I also think that we need to have, just, just as with food, we need to have a healthy a healthy ecosystem, a healthy economy of it. And so if you just were living in a world of... of um, so I, I'm actually an elitist. I'll say that. I'll proudly admit that on this bima. Um, <laughs> I'm not. Um, so that's where we... <laughs> and, and that in order to... So that... To, take the food example. Mm-hmm. So when you have Michelle Obama telling people how they should eat, mm-hmm. that's... That's paternalistic and elitist, and you can mock her for doing that. But it also had an incredible, it, it, well, maybe not an incredible impact, but it helped nudge things in the right direction for the, for the rest of the world. And with culture, ha- having, so, you ha- so we have two different models of, of elitism. There's always elitism. There are always people who are running the system. And you can, they can pretend like they're just responding to market forces, and then you get Facebook, and you get people giving people exactly what they want. You get the wonder breads of information that, that, you know, that go down smooth and are cheap. And, or, or you can have the old, the old system of gatekeeping, which had, its, had real problems. So n- old newspaper editors were had monopolies in their own towns and they got too close to power and there were all sorts of bad things that you could say. And they, and they shut out a lot of people. And they shut out a lot of people. There was a whole lot of bad things that they did. But they also had some consciousness of their power and of their responsibilities to the people who read their newspapers. And um, there was an idea of citizenship, at least, that was embedded within that. Okay, so generally, historically, things don't go backwards. Um, so we settle at, like, what? Like, like, new, better, more diverse, slightly more chaotic gatekeepers? Is that where we want to go culturally? So um, I think that what, what we want to have happen is we want to have people take some sort of sense of ownership and agency over what they consume. And so... This isn't a way that... I mean, so we want people to, to actually care about what they read just as we want them to care about what they eat. And that doesn't mean that you pass up, that, that you, you restrict yourself to like a small canon of things that are acceptable. But it, it means that we just kind of broadly have a sense 
that we need to make more virtuous choices in that regard. Okay. That's not too elitist. I hope That's not. not. It's not. Just a little. A little, but not too much. All right, I have one more um, uh, thing of questions that I want to, one more question I want to ask Frank, but you guys can, can start lining up if anyone has so, questions. But, but, uh, but there's, um, wait, the, well, go ahead. What, what did you want to say? I had. No, but I, I, what's just so galling about Mark Zuckerberg is that this election happens. You've been waiting all 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's galling about Mark Zuckerberg is that the election happens. There's all this evidence that people were fed junk, fed fake things, fed conspiracy. And uh, it happened on his watch and in his system. And it, it, he took no responsibility for it. And so, I mean, I, I actually think forcing those gatekeepers to be more responsible, even if we even if we have to live with them, is, it's, it's, it's filled with peril because they're so powerful. Yeah, but isn't that, I mean, it, to me, it, you know, that argument would just sort of accept and increase the power of Facebook. I'm conflicted about that. Do I tell Mark Zuckerberg, look, it's your fault that Trump was elected and we live in the world that we live in. You should take responsibility and I, you I should totally have done agree. a better job yeah. electing Hillary. Like what, then, well, I then mean, that just, that, that's, you know, an, that's an inadequate solution. I mean, we don't want Mark Zuckerberg to get more powerful, but at the same time, there are problems that he has in his system that he needs to address, but that doesn't solve the problem. What solves the problem is having, having him be less powerful, both through consumers and readers making better choices, and also through antitrust. I mean, this is the debate about the white supremacist side. It's like, yeah. do we want a world where a server has the power to completely take someone offline because they disagree with them? This is the debate happening now. Or do we not want that under any circumstances because then they can take anybody offline? Yeah. Well, what do you think? I think it's, it's a question. So I, I, think that, I think that you... Like, should Storm whatever it's called, Stormfront, like, should they have been I kicked offline? I actually don't think that they should have been kicked offline, but I think that they're, because there the, are ways in which, I think with the, the advertising, I think that there's a lot that they can do better, and then with the people who... You mean the rush? oh. Well, like the Jew hatering uh -huh. advertising, or with the Russian advertising, that seems like it's, you can, you can make those decisions without getting into some of the stickier First Amendment sorts of issues. And I think that when it comes to demanding that people, that, that the fake sites and the, the, the spam farms and all those things that, that the Russians use to exploit uh, the system, I think it's possible to shut those down in a way that where you're just demanding authenticity from the people who are, who are using your system. I mean, I, all, the honesty I would want from Facebook is for them to admit that their algorithms are not clean. Their right. algorithms are as biased as anything else, and they point towards certain directions, and, and, and for everybody to stop thinking that algorithms are yeah. pure. You know what else I find galling about Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we can go to questions. Yeah, you guys, one of you ask about Apple, because I never got to ask Frank, like, why Apple's left out of the book, because that seems to me like the biggest change in human existence is, like, the vehicle by which we access all this information. That's the closest that I get to understanding, like, this is an extension of my arm. The yeah. melding of human and, uh, and machine, the melding of man and machine to me is most obvious in the phone and how, like, how, that's got to be, like, how fast it's transformed yeah. how we live. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you left Apple out because you really love your iPhone. I, 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 I do. Um, no, I, um, I kind of lumped Apple in more generally, but I was so focused on this idea of the intellectual technologies that we're trying to, that we were, we were merging with. And everything you say about the iPhone, seemed, I agree with. And I do think that it's the platform that, that, that for our addiction, and it's obviously designed to be addictive. The, the fact that it comes out every year and, and, and is designed to, to make the last one obsolescent, there's this idea of magic that it cultivates that I think is ultimately at the root of a lot of the, the problems that we have as we think about technology. And I also think it's created, created a psychic shift because people feel like inner panic if they don't have their phone with them. Like it, yeah. it is actually sort of attached to us it is. pretty literally now. It so, is. Yeah. Yeah. We're bad. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. 
Hi, I thank you for the conversation so far. I appreciate the commentary on sort of individual responsibility, but I'm not clear on the policy or legislative stuff. So, so never mind even the ideal, but like what are some things that should be happening that could be happening? Because even the behavior change piece, I mean, it took a major government campaign to get everyone to buckle up. So I have a, I have a couple, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, not an anti, I'm not an antitrust wonk. I'm not a privacy wonk. I had ideas in the book that I outlined in a very broad sort of way that seemed compelling to me. What the Europeans are doing right now seems hugely compelling to me um, because there's really actually a very proud American tradition of trying to constrain communication behemoths that we just don't tolerate monopolies from extending across our history. So it's like the, post, the Postal Service was the first communications monopoly in the United States, and we didn't let the Postal Service get into the telegraph business. And then when Western Union took over the telegraph business, we didn't let them get into the telephone business. And then when AT&T, and it goes on and so forth, up through the, the Microsoft case, which was the last moment that we took, we tried to really constrain things. And you could argue the Microsoft case both ways, but I talked to a lot of people at Google and what they've said is that if, if, the, if Microsoft didn't feel hounded by the government, it would have strangled Google in its crib. It would have tried to remake the browser to try to, 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 to preserve its monopoly. So there, there are two things. One is I think that we need to create a data protection agency in this country. There is no law in this country that governs the use of data, which when you think about it is astounding. Um, secondly, I think we need to think about data in a profoundly different sort of way because data is like, is, is like the environment. Companies do not own the environment and companies do not own our data. The data belongs to us. We can allow them to exploit our data within reason, but when they handle our data, they are, they, we're, we're, they, they're, they, they're trustees of that data. And because they're trustees of that data, we should hold them to a very high set of responsibilities for how they manage and exploit that. And then thirdly, we just need to bring back the, the tradition of antitrust that doesn't just worry about mergers, although that's extremely important, but when there are companies that we deem to be too powerful in their markets, uh, we, we, make, we used to break them up. We did that to AT&T. We, we seriously constrained IBM. And these were all important moments in the history of technology where government action helped create innovation and create spaces for the next new thing. So yes. I have another policy question. Um, I'm curious in... Only in Washington. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about Backpage, and it's prompted a conversation in Congress around amending the Communications Decency Act, which is the 30-year-old piece of legislation that regulates the Internet, and whether or not the Internet should, things like Facebook, should be regulated as a publisher. And I'm curious what your opinion on that is. So I'm not totally well-versed in this issue, but Backpage is uh, a site that... Like the high, that where you can, where prostitution in is for is, trafficking. For, it's for, for sex, sex trafficking happens on that site, and Google basically doesn't accept any responsibility for that. And just as I mean, there, there, it, it goes to the core problem, which is that these companies view themselves as neutral platforms, and so we saw this with copyright, where when Google would just and YouTube would would post anything and that even though I needed, it was my intellectual property and they, and it just, they just didn't want to take responsibility for that. And so this goes to the, the absolute core question of the platforms and whether, if, if, if they're not going to take responsibility for it, then, then somebody has to step in in some, some instances and, and take responsibility for them. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Frank and Hannah. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, I, I was a writer at Slate, and now I'm the science editor at Smithsonian.com. And I have another DC question um, that's going to sound specific, but I think resonates with a lot of journalists here. So like, I think you were talking about how even the best intentioned journalists still have to kind of play by the algorithms that Facebook sets and still have to chase those numbers. So as part of my job, I have to hit a certain traffic. And like, I'd love to do 
stories that we do do about the transformation of national parks and about radical uh, efforts to increase diversity in astronomy. But I get a piece <coughs> across my desk the other day that's like, oysters have herpes and it's killing them. And I have to say yes to it. Because oysters I have, to have remember, herpes? Oysters get herpes, a specific strain of herpes that's deadly to them. So That's kind of interesting. It goes viral, <laughs> no pun intended. Know that. Right. And it's, it's just like designed to be clicked, basically. Well, let me ask you, do you feel like it's changed your... So, so is it added to what you do so that you simultaneously, you know, look at BuzzFeed, which does like so much clickbait, but also like really excellent investigative journalism, yes. you know, like has it added to the thing that you do or has it just, has it sort of like, you know, completely taken off the table things that you would no, otherwise. No, not, not to put you on the spot. Oh, no, but or, or does not, it? Like, this isn't being broadcast. I'll in a put way you that on the spot. Or does it? Does, does it? Is it just that like you do the same work but you put a sexy headline on it? Mm. Um, I think it's the first one you said. It's like you strive to make an ecosystem for yourself. Or like I prioritize like features and investigative pieces. But on a daily basis, I have to hit this traffic level at some point. So I have to add in the traffic drivers. Mm -hmm. So like naturally that takes time away. There's only so much time in the day, right? right? And, and you might add a sexier headline as anyone who works for Slate knows. So. Right, right. Well, th that's, I mean, what, what you're describing is a fundamental tension, which is that uh, when creative industries could afford to be creative, there was, um, you were able to, there was, there was this kind of purity to the pursuit and that it, where you were able to pursue the things that, you, that interested you, you didn't feel like you were having to satisfy an audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately there is something distorting about having to satisfy an audience in that sort of mechanical way. And, and just to, get, to put it more broadly, again, look at our politics. When I was editing The New Republic, I'm, 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 a, I'm a pretty liberal guy, but The New Republic always had this ethos of having a very uh, eclectic mix of, of writers and, and, and was open to conservatives and open to the center in a way in which other magazines weren't. But once it became about satisfying the audience, I felt like I couldn't actually afford, it was like almost a business imperative not to publish heterodox pieces because mm -hmm. it could somehow hurt you with the audience and that the, the and, and, and worse than that, there was this, it was this, we were incentivized to produce pieces that pleased the base. And that didn't feel, in the end, that doesn't feel very intellectually honest and it can't be good for our politics and our culture to have to do that. Right. Do you have any tips for people in that position? I mean, because... Uh, Go cause into it, painting. Sorry? Go into painting, I said. I'm trying to think of the last creative professions that are, that are not um, polluted by uh, the need to... <clears throat> because you're, you're, you're a bit stuck, right? Like, the, the traffic quota is the traffic quota, which is what your, your superiors are expecting of you on... Yeah. So they Any say focus base. more on oyster herpes, and you're like, yeah. well. Well, what, hap what would happen if you, if you actually just pursued the, the subjects that interested you in the way that interested you? Do you think that they would all sink on the internet? Likely. Yeah. <laughs> you well, I like animal sex damn. a lot, but... <laughs> um, no, no, that. but look, I, I, my, my book is fairly apocalyptic on this score. I mean, this is, this is where... I mean, I, I don't think I, I paint any, anything that really, I mean, other than uh, <laughs> searching for whatever outlets somehow manage to resist this. But the truth is that there are, there are hardly any outlets that manage to resist this kind of pressure. It's true. It's, although I feel like my intern, like I don't feel a dearth of beautiful things to read, wonderful journalism, fabulous books. I don't feel that there's, there's less of that in the world. I suppose it's just like there's so much more low-hanging fruit. But I'm not like deprived of beautiful things to read. So maybe it's more about your internal compass, as you said, and sort of keeping an, keeping an internal compass, teaching children how to keep an internal compass, making more people have it, because there's lots of like amazing journalism literature still out there. It hasn't yeah. crushed right. you know, the beautiful soul of creativity. It's just created all this other stuff on bit. top of it. A little bit. Um, <laughs> Thank you guys anyway. so much. Sure. Hi, uh, thank you for, uh, both for being here. Um, Hi. I guess we 
touched on it a little bit, but I was curious, uh, maybe I'm a little bit closer to the mic. Um, I was curious to learn, or uh, if you could share a few more comments on like the sort of marketing advertising structure. It sort of seems like, um, you know, you mentioned that public policy is one avenue for sort of cre uh, fixing some of the, the sort of poor incentivizing that happens in the kind of tech industry. But it, it seems also like without addressing um, the sort of economic model of advertising, that there are certain things that like will still be very hard to sort so of correct. I, I, I agree with you. I completely agree with you, which is why I think that part of what I'm asking us, not just to be conscious about um, what we read, but also to, uh, to, to pay for what we read. Yeah, it, it seems like there would need to be <coughs> some um, healthy culture of, yeah, paying for good journalism um, <laughs> that... Um, would sort of have to be yeah, culturally instilled in people. Right, and it just as, I mean, that's why the, <clears throat> the food model is actually an optimistic one because when it comes to food, a lot of people in this country, maybe, maybe only at an elite level, but have made decision that in order to get the good stuff, you have to pay for it, and you're going to sacrifice efficiency and that you're, gonna, you're going to engage in a way that privileges a more communal experience or that makes you feel more wholesome. And so I think that there is a hopeful example that suggests that that's possible. But ultimately, I think everybody in media that's thinking about these problems understands exactly that advertising is a devil's bargain and that they have to shift much harder in the direction of subscriptions. And they've made, they've tiptoed in that direction, but they're still not charging very much for subscriptions relative to what they charged for, for print subscriptions. So I think that that's ultimately going to accelerate. That was one of my favorite parts of the book when you went into the TNR archives and found that some, I can't remember who it was, had been paid $150 for a piece, which is like in real numbers, R written more. In the, written in the Great Depression. Yes, more than what uh, on people get paid to write pieces yeah. now online. We probably have time for four more, so two on each side. Go ahead. Hello, very interesting. And I want to say that your article in uh, um, August, July, and the uh, the blue edition of the Atlantic yeah. about um, your experiences at New Republic was really amazing. Thank you. The, the debate in journalism. Thank so you. it seems as if I've heard that the technology is much like cocaine, but kind of goes in slower and it's not as high very fast. Um, so I'm wondering, do we ever have a chance once this started to not be in a world all narked up on this technology? Yeah, so... I mean, I continue, I continue to think that it's possible. I mean, I would, is your question that we could have made better? Just, I mean, obviously we could have made better choices along the way as, as within, within media and probably as individuals about how we navigated these things. But I think where we stand now, we still, there's still chance, you know, opportunities for us to, to do better in, in terms of how we, how we fit into this system, in terms of what in terms of what we read, the choices that we make, um, how we spend our leisure time. Um, and again, it's, it's just, it's, it's hokey, but um, when, I, when, I, when I read, I mean, I, in, over the course of a day, I, I, find, I look for spaces, I crave spaces where I can be alone with ideas and with with words and with, with thoughts and just to, to think about things. And it's so hard to do when you exist in this trance where you're sitting and you're clicking all the time and you're worried about something that you've just posted to Twitter and how people are going to respond to it and whether they're going to like it or not. I mean, that's a classic example of how uh, the awareness of audience and the instant response of audience ends up shaping your behavior as a writer and thinker. Um, and so book, you know, just to be able to escape with a book for a few, for, for a few minutes over the course of the day does tend to your soul in, in a way. It is, it is a virtuous choice. And to subscribe, I don't, people are so unacculturated to subscribing to things now. I mean, I don't want to even, I don't want to embarrass you by asking what you subscribe to. We have, it. We have the Atlantic, don't worry. Well, that's, that's an excellent <laughs> choice. Kudos to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, keep it up. Uh, uh, but but the, the Atlantic now has a masthead service. Uh, I don't think I see Goldberg in the room, so you won't know that I'm, I'm, I'm shilling for the Atlantic. 
but where you there's kind of an enhanced product that you can get where you're more of a benefactor uh, to, to the institution uh, than just getting the 10 print copies at a cut rate price. Yes. So uh, you touched on the old guard versus the new, and my question is when you have you know, establishment journalists like, like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal who are engaging on these newer platforms like Twitter and Snapchat and stuff, do you see that as them like clawing back some ground that they lost or almost giving in to this new technology? I mean, I think it's changing them in lots of ways. I, I look, and, and not always for the good, I look at a lot of New York Times reporters, who, and the, the New York Times is what, it, it's, it is the common basis or was the common basis for fact in this country. And even conservatives who used to deride mainstream media would, would actually have to pay attention to what was published in the New York Times. And so I see a lot of New York Times reporters kind of going off in ways that they would never be able to do in the New York Times on Twitter, where they decry things in, in very hyperbolic terms. And I think to myself, that, that's, that's ultimately not great for the brand of the New York Times, but even worse, ultimately not great for the project of constructing a common basis for fact. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for writing this. I think you delve into some really important questions. Um, you mentioned earlier that we all kind of think privacy is important in some vague way, but haven't necessarily cashed out what that means fully. And you alluded to one possibility, which is that it allows political dissent when there's private discussion among people. But it seems like privacy has sort of different senses, right? There's the privacy of your thoughts within your own mind yes. versus within groups of people. And so I'm wondering, in the first sense, if there's something more you can add about maybe what's being lost in that kind of um, individual private realm when we don't have privacy and, and maybe I mean, is anyone really saying at this point that technology is interfering with our ability to have a private thought, per se, other than through just distraction? And, and is there um, more you can add about maybe what's being lost there? Well, it's, it's not just distraction. I mean, I think it, it's also, you're, you are being tracked. There is a material record being kept of the things that you read and the things that you search for. And all that is, is a portrait of your mind. I mean, Google boasts. I mean, I, it, so one of the things that is kind of, is, was chilling about this pro project was that you could go back and you could, I've read everything that the tech executives wrote about and said about human nature. And Eric Schmidt boasted that Google knows where you're going to be tomorrow within, within 24 hours, within like, you know, 500 feet based on your past. Uh, patterns, and that Google, Google can pre predict your behavior based on past patterns. And so when it supplies you with information, it's really just supplying you with information based on this intimate portrait that they have of your, 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 your psyche. And does that end up having a chilling effect on you now? Probably not so much, because we ch all collectively choose to ignore the fact that we're being tracked. But I think that over time, it's going to start to exact a toll. Um, I just wanted to, I, I think we probably have to wrap up, but I, I wanted to say one other thing about, about this book and this project, which is that, as you can tell, a lot of these questions are extremely hard questions where there isn't an obvious solution um, that, that's at hand to us. But we, we all have this nagging sense I think, that something's going on, that things are changing, and we hope that it'll change, out, change in a fantastic sort of way, and then you wake up on November, what it was, 5th or 6th, and you realize that the world isn't necessarily marching in, towards progress, that we're not necessarily moving in a utopian sort of direction. You look at the, the inequality in our society, it, it, you, you, you look at all these problems and you have to say that something has gone wrong in this country at, in an institutional sort of way and that, that all these big changes that were meant to bring progress aren't necessarily bringing progress. And we're about to take even bigger leaps forward into the future and we're in, in ways in which we can't understand. So when Zuckerberg talks about 
telepathy as a technology, we could laugh at him. We could say maybe this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, but he's hired the best scientists in the world to develop this, and maybe there is something there. And maybe the these, these, this sci-fi future is really just a few steps ahead of us. And so the core question really is, what, what do we want human beings to be? How do we want to... Do we, we need to think about the future in a much more intentional sort of way, especially since we don't know what's going to happen to the future of work. We, we, we know that automation is happening extremely quickly. We look at Amazon buying Whole Foods, and you can say that the grocery store as we know it is probably not going to exist in a couple of years, and that, that there'll be drones, and, and, and there probably won't be cashiers. And that's just a small taste of what automation could potentially do to us. And none of this is monocausal. There are all sorts of things that are happening in our world. We live in a globalized world. Uh, the, 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 the political problems and social problems that we face in this country have ample, ample causes. But this is really just something where the change has happened, it, the, we can see the rise of these corporations, and we can start to think about the choices that we make, not just in our own lives, but as a, as a society. And rather than just drift off into a future, we should be we should be as thoughtful about it as possible. We should be skeptical when skepticism is merited. And we should remember that even if it's hard to see the ways in which we have human agency, we still have human agency. Um, and I will add to that, that's what I think is beautiful and critical about this book and why everyone should read it and everyone will be talking about it is because it just... You can't, unless you're aware of the air that you're breathing and sort of like the life that you're living and, and, and what's behind it and what's in it, you can't change it. So, so at the very least, read it to understand the ideology behind everything that you're, you're doing and thinking. Um, I think we'll end it there. Thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs>